Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21, as we continue our lesson on angels. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 21, and here's what it says. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. You see that? And the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Now in the last lesson we considered three areas of truth about angels. First of all we considered that angels cannot be numbered. You know, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 22, it says, As you come to the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, the human mind cannot count that far as how many angels that God has created. There, there's trillions and if whatever above the trillions, you know, I don't know. But we can never count the angels. There's so many. And then we consider the organization of angels in Ephesians 6, verse 12, Colossians 1, verse 16. And remember, we talked about this pyramid, and God is at the top. Under him are the seraphim, the, cherub, the cherubim, the archangels, the kings, the thrones, the dominions, the princes or principalities, the powers, the rulers, and the messengers. And at the bottom of that pyramid, the angels are more numerous but lesser in power. At the top of the pyramid, they're fewer in number, but greater in power. And so, you know, we need to keep that in mind. <clears throat> then also we consider the fact that departed saints do not become angels. No matter what TV movies show you, Departed saints can never become angels. Angels are created beings separate from the human race. And I'm going to ask Sister Patty to read for us Acts 12, verse 15. And listen closely. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. Okay, now, some people use this to say that Peter had died, and they believed he'd become an angel. That's not, what that, that's not what that's teaching. The word angel comes from the Greek word pneuma, and it can be translated angel or spirit. And in this case, they're saying, well, Peter's died in prison, and now his spirit is out here knocking at the gate. That's the truth of the matter. They're not saying, it's not saying here that uh, Peter died and became an angel, all right? Angels are always distinct from the departed saints. Now, in the text, in 1 Timothy 5, 21, we see that angels are watchers. They're observers. They observe everything we do. And I'm going to ask Sister Shirley to read for us 1 Corinthians 11, verses 5 through 10. 1 Corinthians 11, 5 through 10. But every, but every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. That is even all one as if she were shaven. For if a woman be not covered, let her head be shorn, also be shorn. But if, it, but if it is be a shame for a woman to be shaved or shorn, that word, shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head so, or as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. I think I said some angels. Just keep on reading. Um, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to be power, have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither is the woman without the man in the Lord. Okay, thank you, sister. Now, what this is teaching is that 
women that are married to a man, they're to be obedient to that man. And uh, if they're not obedient to their husband, the angels are offended. They're offended. And uh, how many angels are offended at women that say to their husbands, you're not the boss of me? And you know, that's offensive to God and it's offensive to the angels because angels understand, the, the holy angels understand only the authority of God. And that's who they're obedient to. They expect us to be obedient to him as well. Now, as we study God's word, we see that angels have specific ministries. And we're going to consider the ministries of the Old Testament saints. First of all, we're going to consider the ministry they had to Abraham. And I'm going to read from the book of Genesis, chapter 18. Genesis 18. 1 through 5, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. Now at first, Abraham probably did not know that these were angels. What makes me think that? Well, look at verse 2. These angelic beings did not look like angels. Verse 2, it says, And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men. He saw them as men. He said they stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now, bowing was an oriental custom. It wasn't that he was falling down to worship them. But he was bowing in respect to them. This is an oriental custom, as I said. Now, I'm going to ask Brother Phil to read for us Hebrews 13 and verse 2. Remember them that are in bonds. Oh, no. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Thank you, Brother Phil. Now, if somebody comes to you, <coughs> And you think he, that might be an angel. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If he uses foul language, he's not an angel. <laughs> and, and you know, there, there's a story. Now, I don't know how true this story is. Maybe somebody made it up, but, but I, I want to tell it to you anyway. The story was told me back several years ago that there was a man driving on the interstate somewhere in the United States and uh, he was an unbeliever. He did not believe the Bible. He did not believe in God. He was a left-wing socialist. And anyway, he saw a young man hitchhiking. So he pulled over and picked him up, took off on down the interstate doing 65 or 70 miles an hour. And this young man began to witness to him. He told him that Christ came and died on the cross for your sins. And the man sitting there kind of chuckling and laughing. So this young man continued to tell him about the second coming of Jesus Christ. This man was still laughing. He looked out the window <clears> and, <throat> inside and he turned around to say something to this young man and he wasn't there. Now I don't know how true that story is, but could it not be true? I believe it could be true. Now, I don't know what you believe about it, but I, I just, maybe I'm just old and gullible, but I just believe things like that. Now, when they appear, they appear as men unless they appear to a saint that is on the verge of passing through the door into heaven. And then they appear as they are. And so... Also, these angelic beings had the ability to eat and drink. 
Now that tells us they had the ability to put on physical form. They're a spirit being, but they have the ability to take on a physical <coughs> form. And so I'm going to ask Brother Russ to read for us Genesis 18 and verse 8. Yeah. And he took butter and milk and a calf to the spirit and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And notice it says, and they did eat. Why why do they eat and drink? They don't have to. But no, it's it, it's an enjoyable thing. I, I like to eat. Don't you like to eat? And you know, looking over at Luke 24, verses 40 through 43, listen to this. It says, And when he had thus spoken, talking about the Lord, he shewed them his hands and his feet, and while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And so, you know, the Lord didn't have to eat. But he did, because eating is an enjoyable thing. Now, we notice also that angels ministered to Hagar. And I'm going to ask, uh, now let's see, I'll, I'll just read this one, okay? This is, this is Genesis 21. Verse 14 through 20. What a bit of reading there, but I'm going to read it. It says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar and putting it on her shoulder and, and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. And rise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the, in the wilderness and became an archer. Now, why was Sarah, I, I mean, why was Hagar in the desert? Because Sarah had been instrumental in sending her away. Remember, Hagar is a mom, I mean, Sarah is the one who talked Abraham into going into Hagar and producing an heir, which was Ishmael. But Sarah later had baby Isaac, and so there was a, a problem there between them. And so Sarah demanded of Abraham that he send Hagar away. That's why she's out here in the desert. But notice, God sent his angel and uh, anyway, he showed her a well of water, and there she got the water and saved her, her and the lad's life. And so now, we notice also angels ministered to Lot. I'm going to ask Deanna to please read for us Genesis 19, 1 through 5. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat at the gate, in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them gently, and they turned into him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, 
Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out to us, and we may, that we may know them. Okay, the wicked people here saw these angels as good-looking men. They wanted to sodomize them. Now look at what it says in verse 11. It says, And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. These angels were ministers of mercy on behalf of Lot and his daughters, and they were ministers of judgment upon the ungodly. And I'm going to ask Brother Tim to read for us Luke 17, 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans Luke 17, 29. same day that Lot went out of Sodom and rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So you know, God judges homosexuality. You know, I've had people say, well, you know, they can't help it because they're born that way. Well, let me tell you something. God destroyed both Sodom and Gomorrah because of their homosexuality. Now, do you know of any other incident where God has destroyed a person because they were born blind or they were born deaf or they were born crippled? No. God's a God of mercy. But God hates homosexuality. And you know, in uh, 1 Kings 15, verse 9, it says, And in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa, Asa over Judah. Judah was the little part of Israel there to the south of Israel. You know, the 10 tribes went north, two tribes went south. It says, in 41 years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Micah, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. Now get this. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Now it says he took away the Sodomites. What does that mean? I believe he killed them. You know, I just believe that's what happened. And uh, you know, today, AIDS is killing certain homosexuals that, you know, they get the AIDS. And I remember one time out there in Omak, I was walking down in front of the drugstore and they had a Wenatchee paper, newspaper there on one of the machines and, and I was reading on it and it said there's over a hundred different strains of AIDS and every time they try to treat one of those strains it mutates into three or four other different strains that's why they can't get control of it it's God's judgment on the homosexual crowd now Let's move on. Here we see the angels ministered to Jacob. Jacob met angels as he was walking. Sister Monica, would you please read for us Genesis 32, verses 1 and 2. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of the place Maenam. Is that how you pronounce that? <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at that and I thought, I'm going to have somebody else read that. <laughs> Man, I am, something like that. But anyway, does God do this today? Well, God does not do this just for our infatuation. But I believe those that are near the door of death that are saints, I believe oftentimes God sends his angels to assure them, to comfort them. And you know, our daughter Marie there, she almost died from chemo. She's in the hospital 15 days. But she told her mom and I, 
that she saw an angelic being. And he said to her, don't worry, you're not going to die. And I can't say that she didn't see that. I can't say that. Maybe she did. She knows. And then I had a cousin named George Kahn. He was married to uh, my cousin Edna May, which was kind of like a sister to me. We grew up together. Anyway, George Kahn and, and my cousin Edna May, they got married, and they was married for, I don't know, a few years. And George, he contracted cancer, and it was incurable. He was dying. And they went to bed one night, and he was close to dying. And anyway, the next morning, he said to Edna May, he said, last night, he said, I woke up, and at the foot of my bed, there was this big, beautiful angel summoning to me to come. And you know, there was an old preacher by the name of John Oxtoby. He was a godly old preacher. And on his deathbed, he said to his family members, he said, do you see him? They said, what, what, what? Don't you see the angels? How beautiful they are. And they're white. Their white uh, garments are glistening white. And they're beckoning to me to come. And he laid his head back on his pillow and he was gone. <laughs> and so, you know, things like this happen. I have, I have a book at home called Voices from the Edge of Eternity. It's out of print now. But I've had that book for years. And... It tells some short stories in there about saints and what they saw just before they died and unsaved people and what they saw when they died. And there's a world of difference. One guy was not saved and he'd rejected Christ all of his life and he was just before he died, he was screaming, the black angel is after me. He's coming to get me. Somebody help me. And he just died right there. And so, you know, there's the evil side, and then there's the holy side. And so anyway, we notice that Jacob wrestled with an angel at a place called Peniel. And I'm going to ask Brother Dunn to read for us Genesis 32, verses 24 through 32. Thank you, Brother Dunn. Now, this was no doubt the pre-incarnate Christ. Before he was born as a baby in Bethlehem, he was the second, is the second person of the Holy Trinity called the angel of the Lord. Now, in Scripture, if you find, find a Scripture that says an angel of the Lord, usually that's talking, talking about an angelic being. And then sometimes you'll find the words the angel of the Lord, that's not, the word the is not capitalized. That's probably just a regular angel. But when, it, when the, the T is capitalized, the angel of the Lord, that's talking about the pre-incarnate Christ. And you know, in Hosea 11 and verse 4, and I was studying this yesterday and I just came across this, it says, he wrestled in prayer. With the Lord, so he he wrestled in prayer with the Lord. He wrestled physically with the Lord, and the Lord touched the hollow of his thigh, and they called caused him to limp away from that scene. And so, anyway, here we see how this the angel of the Lord dealt with Jacob, 
And then we saw, we see also that uh, angels ministered to Moses. And uh, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, Genesis 19, and they were ordained by angels. I'm going to ask Sister Dunn to please read for us Galatians 3, 19 through 20. And Christ, of course, is our great mediator between us and God the Father. It's not the Virgin Mary. You need to understand that. It's, the Virgin Mary is not our mediatrix, you know, as the Catholics teach. But anyway, here, why did God need the angels to ordain his law? Why do you think he needed the angels to do that? Well, let me ask you another question. Why do you think God uses God-called preachers to ordain other God-called preachers? Anybody got a thought on that? Well, my thought is this. Because God wanted to. <laughs> when God wants to do something, he does it. And whether we understand it or not, it doesn't matter. When God decides to do something, it's always right. He never makes a mistake. Never has, never will. All right, now, we find also God used angels to help Moses in teaching all that was contained in the law. And I'm going to ask Sister Lisa to read for us Acts 7, 52 and 53. Thank you, Sister Lisa. Now, the law, the prophets, and the ministry of angels all pointed to the com coming of Christ. And the Jews, the majority of the Jews, rejected it. In John 1, and verse 11, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of Jews that's gotten saved, but the majority of them, did not, did not accept Christ as their Messiah. They're still looking for their Messiah. And Jesus said in Scripture, he said, he said, I come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. He said, if or since another will come in his own name, him you will receive. We're talking about the Antichrist. And they're going to accept him as their Messiah during the tribulation period. But, uh, there in the Old Testament, I was reading this, I can't remember which, Obadiah maybe, I'm not sure. But it says one third of Israel will turn to Christ during the tribulation period. Only one third. And uh, that leaves two thirds that are going to be destroyed. And so anyway, we have seen the ministry of angels to the Old Testaments and to us today. So anybody got a question? What in Hosea, where were you in Hosea? Hosea 11, verse 4. Verse 4? Yeah. Okay, thank you. You want to read it? Well, I, yeah, I was, I was looking it up, and I, and I couldn't, you didn't get to Hosea in time. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it here. Hosea 11 and verse 5. It says, He shall not return into the land of Egypt, but... Ooh, 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 ooh. That's not it. Verse 4, I'm sorry. 11 verse 4. I drew them with cords of a man with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke for the result. That's not it either. I must have mismarked it. It's in there. The verses 12, 4. 
It's, yea, he had power over the angel of the veil. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel and there he spake with him. Where was it? Hosea 12, 4. 12, 4. Hosea 12, 4. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Well, I couldn't see it when I tried to look it up, and I thought that's what I heard there before. All right. Well, we started a little bit early, so we're closing a little bit early. So give us time to fellowship and and uh, gossip a little, you know. And <laughs> no, you never want to gossip. Anyway, let's bow our heads and we'll be dismissed in prayer and we'll get ready for church. Yes, Brother Russ. I think 